Three Russian torpedoes bear down and leave 9,300 people dead. The worst maritime disaster in history. Thousands of Germans fled the onslaught of a Soviet army bent on capturing Berlin and exacting revenge for Hitler's brutal invasion of Russia. There was no mercy. They began to kill, they began to burn, they began to rape. Millions escaped to the sea. But thousands wouldn't get very far. As the torpedoes exploded, as the freezing water rushed in to the lower decks, for a frightening second, everyone knew that was the end. In the closing months of World War II, a German refugee ship, the Wilhelm Gustloff, was sunk by torpedoes fired by a Soviet submarine. More than 9,000 perished in history's deadliest sinking. Nine days later, the same lethal submarine struck at another German ship. This time, 4,000 died. Was the submarine commander a masterful enemy, or were the ships doomed from the start? Join us for Killer Submarine. The story of the worst maritime disaster begins in Hamburg, Germany on May 5th, 1938 with the launch of the Wilhelm Gustloff. For jubilant Adolf Hitler, it's a Nazi dream come true. A state-of-the-art passenger ship built to reward factory workers with state-paid vacations. But the Gustloff is more than a cruise ship hosting free vacations. It is a tool in Hitler's scheme to brainwash the German public with Nazi ideals. The Gustloff is just another manifestation of this one race, a master race, one people. And you can't have one people unless everyone understands the Nazi program, the Nazi politic, and where they fit in it. The Gustloff became a good setting for Nazi propaganda because it showed to the German people the life they can have if they work hard. Hitler's propaganda ship carries rank-and-file factory workers who embody the ideal of the Nazi work ethic to the world's most alluring ports. Through pleasure-filled days and nights, they enjoy a taste of the good life. There is plenty of dining and dancing. They're also treated to lectures on Hitler's plan for Germany. But behind the facade of a happy totalitarian state and free vacations lies a sinister plot. Yes, it had a swimming pool. Yes, it had a bandstand. But from the outset, this ship was intended to be a military troop transport, pure and simple. After 14 months as the Nazi love boat, the party ends. September 1st, 1939, Hitler starts the Second World War. In a matter of days, Poland surrenders. Gottenhofen, a port on the Gulf of Danzig, becomes a stronghold for the German Navy in the Baltic. Here, the Gustloff begins her wartime duties as a training ship for German U-boats. The massive submarine production program that they had required thousands of highly trained submarine officers and enlisted men. The Gustloff was one of several ships that they converted to schoolhouses. Submarine candidates, officer cadets, and some enlisted men lived on board. It was a combination ship. But in this respect, the Gustloff had a very important role in helping to prepare these young men for submarine service. June 1941, the Soviet Union, neutral throughout Hitler's conquest of Western Europe, is forced into the war when Germany invades its borders. 
On the Eastern Front, the fighting is the most brutal in the war. Well, the savage from the German side was simply that the Russians have to be reduced to a slave population. And if, if millions of them die, it really doesn't matter. And Hitler told the German officers at the beginning of the invasion of Russia that the Russian is no comrade. These are people of a different breed, and you don't have to treat them as comrades at war. And Germans had really the right to kill any Russians they wanted. In the Baltic Sea, German warships and minefields devastate the Soviet Navy, especially her submarines. Two weeks into the war, 11 Soviet submarines had been lost, and within six months, 27 boats had gone down. This represents about a third of the Soviet submarine force in June of 1941. As a result, Soviet submarines attempted less frequently to run the minefields and, in effect, uh, became a non-participant in the war. On land, the war is equally disastrous. The cities of Kharkov, Kiev, and Odessa fall. Leningrad is under siege. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people dying from hunger, illness, infection, pneumonia, from the German bombardment. Day and night, German artillery is blasting the city. Uh, the situation in Leningrad is almost as if it were hit by an atomic bomb. People are reduced to eating, I can't say rats and mice because they went in the first month or two, but leather, because leather has some animal nourishment in it. But Leningrad holds out. It is a hero city. After 900 days, the siege fails. A Red Army counteroffensive drives the Germans back in a state of retreat and surrender. The tide of the war has turned. October 1944. The Germans have lost more than a million men in Russia since the start of the war. Soviet losses range as high as 9 million soldiers and sailors and 20 million civilians. And the killing is not yet over. The Red Army is out for revenge. When the Soviets went on the counterattack to recapture their land, and they saw what the Germans had done to the land, to the people, to the cities, the towns, the devastation, the destruction, the murder, the mass graves, they in turn wanted to inflict more. They wanted greater than revenge on the Germans. When they started moving into, into Poland, then into, into East Russia and into Germany, and meeting less and less resistance, they went wild. They began to kill, they began to burn, they began to rape. And that brutalization was, was terrible. The Russians close in on Gottenhofen, where the Gustloff is training German submarine crews. Irene Kuzobovka, then 11 years old, remembers the horror of the Soviet air raids. Once when we were uh, bombed, we went to the market one day and there laid a hand. Somebody's hand had been cut off and laid there beside a big hole where the bomb went in. As the Red Army pushes west, Soviet submarines trapped in port for three years finally return to the Baltic Sea. One of them is the S-13, a medium-range attack submarine. She is 255 feet long and can dive to periscope depth 40 feet in 45 seconds. Her speed ranges from 8 knots under sea to 18 knots on the surface, slower than her German counterparts. Her crew numbers 46 men. All are eager to get back into the war. One of them is Fyodor Davidov, an 18-year-old assigned to the torpedo room. During that time, the mood among our crew was patriotic. Patriotism to protect one's own motherland. And now, once back at sea, more than anything else, we wanted revenge. Because the crew of the Soviet submarine S-13 has been in port for so long, they work hard to make up for lost training and tactical experience. But one problem, one obstacle they can do nothing to overcome is the sea itself. The Baltic is a bad place for submarines. 
The worst feature is how shallow it is in places, 100 feet, 200 feet, when you're a few miles offshore. Submarine stays close to the surface to do its job, to look for ships, to shoot torpedoes. But once it's made an attack, it wants to go deep, two or 300 feet. Still, the S-13 is undaunted. With 12 torpedoes, each 23 and a half feet long and loaded with 660 pounds of TNT, she packs a deadly punch. But her most lethal weapon is her captain, 32-year-old Alexander Marinesco. Fyodor Davidov, the last surviving crew member of Marinesco's submarine, remembers his skipper. Marinesco was a very confident commander. He always felt comfortable at sea. He believed in his crew and that the boat under his command would do whatever he said. We were in situations when German subs attacked us, launched torpedoes at us, and even were attacked by planes. His orders always got us out alive. But Captain Marinesco is ill-suited for the Soviet Navy. He is a maverick, determined to run the sub his way. On the other hand, his superiors demand nothing less than blind obedience and despise his independent thinking and actions. Yet the very traits they object to are what make him a great commander. Marinesco had a gift, a natural gift of bravery. He was sure of himself. He always knew what to do in battle. He was decisive, and that helped him always beat his opponent at critical moments. November 1944. Finland has switched sides from Germany to the Soviet Union. Her port of Turku is an ideal base for submarines. It is free of mines and closer to German ships. Marinesco was ordered to take the S-13 there, but hundreds of mines are in his path. The trip is so risky, all but four torpedoes, enough for one salvo, are removed from the ship. The Soviet logic is that if the S-13 sinks, her full complement of 12 torpedoes won't go to waste. Running the minefield is fraught with danger. Sailors would be totally quiet, not because noise could activate the mines, they were contact mines, the submarine had to brush it to make it explode. But they would be still and quiet because they were petrified with fear. Everything's closed up. The men are standing at their battle stations, ready to jump for the hatch. The boat's going slowly, two, three, four, five knots at most. Traversing the minefield could take a couple of hours. Then there might be another one, and a third one, depending upon what area they were in. Not very good for your coronary system. Through Captain Marinesco's skill and luck, the S-13 arrives safely at Turku. The entire crew celebrates in typical Russian fashion. Soon, Captain Marinesco was ordered to patrol the Eastern Baltic and sink anything German. The sub is loaded with torpedoes for battle. There is enough food on board for 45 days at sea. The S-13 is scheduled to leave for patrol with three other Soviet submarines on the second day of January 1945. But two days before departure, Marinesco disappears. He was at a drunken binge inside a Finnish bordello and missed the assignment. The crew found Marinesco, dried him out in a sauna. The other submarines with which they were supposed to operate had left. The Soviet security police, the NKVD, is outraged. They want Marinesco court-martialed and shipped off to Siberia. But the more pragmatic Navy decides that even an out-of-control captain is more useful at sea than in Siberia. Rear Admiral Nikolai Smirnov, Marinesco's commanding officer, admonished him to make something of yourself. No doubt he took this to heart, maybe taking it as, you better make something of yourself. With some luck, Marinesco was about to get an opportunity to do just that. January 17, 1945. Captain Marinesco is at sea in the Baltic. After having been reprimanded for being drunk and derelict in his duties, he needs some success. He needs to sink a German ship. Any kind will do. But after eight days of hunting, he finds no enemy ships. Marinesco then heads for the coast of German-occupied Poland and the port of Gottenhofen, a major German naval station and the home of the Gustloff. 
в Данциге было сосредоточено очень много немецких кораблей. But Marinesco went anyway. He went to the epicenter of the war at sea. It was a big risk because the Germans had enough sea power to find the submarine very easily. Captain Marinesco heads for a war zone so dangerous the Soviet Navy has avoided it. Fearing he will be ordered away or reprimanded for leaving his assigned patrol area, Marinesco decides to do this on his own without asking or even informing his superiors. For the S-13 captain, indiscretion is the better part of valor. At the same time the Soviet sub heads toward the port of Gottenhofen, German Admiral Karl Durnitz is ordering the evacuation of two and a half million Germans, the largest evacuation in history, across the Baltic Sea to the western part of Germany. As the Red Army moved westward, there were pockets of German-occupied areas in the Baltic states, in Poland. The area around Danzig was one of these. And immediately, tens of thousands of refugees, troops, poured into Danzig and the adjacent cities. Admiral Dernitz initiated Operation Hannibal, which sent scores of warships, transports, cargo ships, into these pockets to pull out primarily troops, then women and children, and then everyone else. At Gottenhofen, German refugees arrive on foot, in horse-drawn carriage, cars, anything that moves, to board evacuation ships to go west. Paul Niehaus, then a sailor in the German Navy, recalls the pandemonium. Everybody knew the war is lost, and the Russians are coming. They had heard many stories of uh, injuries, killing, raping women. It was a panic that had come over the population. The Gustloff, once a cruise ship next to submarine schoolhouse, is now a refugee ship. Final preparations are made to secure lifeboats and life jackets for the voyage. More than 10,000 people jam-pack a ship built to hold a mere 1,400. Every inch of space is taken. On the sun deck, a nursery is set up for two dozen pregnant women. In a drained swimming pool, 373 young female naval auxiliaries sleep in a makeshift dormitory. At the main salon, several hundred women and children crowd together. Among them is Zima Kuzobovka and her daughters Irene, 11, Ellen, 6, and cousin Evelyn, 13. Irene remembers the day the Gustloff left Gottenhofen for Kiel on January 30th, 1945. Men had to stay behind, so dad stayed behind. There were over 3,000 children and their mothers on board, plus wounded soldiers. We got on board and apparently we left in the early afternoon. It would be just like a day's trip. We, we were to go on board and uh, do not get undressed because we'll be there the next morning. The weather is cruel. Snow is falling, the wind is strong, the seas are heavy. The temperature is 18 degrees below zero. Shortly after one in the afternoon, the Gustloff leaves Gottenhafen. Despite the cramming in the ship, despite the snow, the cold, the lack of food, there's got to have been a, a, a frightening sense of safety. At last we made it. We're on our way to the fatherland. We're the lucky ones. The Gustloff is supposed to leave with three escorts, but two are delayed, and to wait for them would risk attack from Russian artillery and aircraft. One escort would have to do. On the ship are two officers, Captain Frederick Peterson, who runs the Gustloff, and Lieutenant Commander Wilhelm Zahn, who's in charge of the 1,000 submarine cadets on board. On the bridge, they debate the choice of routes to take. Heinz Schoen, then an 18-year-old, remembers the fateful discussion. Captain Peterson, Captain Peterson and Lieutenant Commander Zahn didn't agree on the course to take. One was further out into the Baltic, which was considered less dangerous, but it was longer. The other was a shorter course along the coast, but one littered with mines. 
Zahn insists on taking the shorter route closer to shore to get the Gustloff's 1,000 submarine cadets back as soon as possible. They are needed to man a new fleet of U-boats Hitler pledges will win the war. Furthermore, as a U-boat commander, Zahn rules out any danger from submarines. He believes the Soviet Navy has been annihilated, and even if any were left, no submarine captain in his right mind would attack so close to shore. Being closer inshore, you're a more difficult target for the submarines, because submarines are one submerged, two, they like to have a couple of hundred feet of water under their keel after they attack, so they can go deep to escape. There are only mines to fear. The ship radios ahead for sweepers to clear a path. At 1800 hours, there was a message that a flotilla of German minesweepers were bearing down on an easterly course. The Wilhelm Gustloff was of course heading west. This was considered adding a danger of collision, so it was decided to put the position lights on. Meanwhile, the Soviet submarine is doing the unexpected. Captain Marinesco is exactly where Zahn and the others believe no submarine would be, hugging the coast in shallow water. The Gustloff's position lights intended to help the ship are an invitation to disaster. Just before 8 p.m., Marinesco sees them. With the element of surprise on his side, he draws closer. Under the cover of darkness and weather, the small submarine is practically invisible. At 300 yards, Marinesco sees the largest target of his life. But the attack is very risky. He saw an escort on the Gustloff's ocean side, a dangerous escort. For that reason, he decided to put his boat away from it on the other side and away from any threat of retaliation. But there is only one way, a dangerous way, to accomplish this. Captain Marinesco has to dive the S-13 under the Gustloff in water only 170 feet deep when the S-13 ideally requires 400. One mistake and he could have gotten stuck. It was a risk, but we say if you don't risk, you don't drink champagne. On a moonless night with poor visibility, the S-13 surfaces in position to attack from the shore side. It is now 8 p.m. on the Gustloff. Seemingly, all is well. Passengers are sleeping or trying to. One of them was a young girl, Ellen Kusabovka. I was wearing a white fur coat underneath this stupid um, life jacket that I desperately wanted to take off, and I was crying and crying, and my mother wouldn't let me take it off. With Ellen is her older sister, Irene. We boarded the ship. We were put into this big salon. We just stayed and were good as gold, I suppose, and we didn't have any food, as I can remember. There was just this big empty room with this grand piano. And so, therefore, we laid against the walls because there were no chairs and uh, had our life jackets on, and we sort of lulled to sleep, I guess, towards the evening. As the Gustloff heads west 12 hours from a safe harbor, Captain Marinesco is shadowing her. He waits to attack, hoping to come into deeper water where he can escape safely. So far, the depth is still shallow, 160 to 180 feet. Marinesco knows he can't wait forever. He must decide soon whether to forego this opportunity or take his chances in the shallow Baltic. At this same hour, 250 miles away in Berlin, Adolf Hitler is giving a speech to commemorate the 30th of January, the 12th anniversary of his ascension to power. The speech reaches all the way to the decks of the Gustloff. You have then the situation of six, seven, eight, nine thousand passengers, the crew of the ship, the officers, the sailors, they know they've made it. They're safe. They're en route home to Germany, to the fatherland. You even have a certain inner warmth, I'm sure, with some of the people, certainly not all, that were on the ship that night, as they hear Hitler's words. Not only are they going home, but there's, there's still a hope for victory. At 9 p.m., thunderous applause marks the end of Hitler's speech and echoes through the Gustloff. At this moment, Soviet Captain Marinesco decides to attack. A few minutes after 9, 
he orders a torpedo salvo that is about to turn the 30th of January, 1945, into the cruelest night the Baltic has ever seen. Ali. Crewman Kurochkin sent the first and second torpedoes. Then on the left side, we tried to launch the third torpedo, but it didn't go, so we tried the fourth. Three torpedoes streak toward the Gustloff. They are 90 seconds away from impact and closing fast. January 30th, 1945. The Gustloff is packed with more than 10,000 German refugees and military personnel heading across the Baltic Sea. It is a frigid winter's night. After days of fear and uncertainty, a sense of peace finally sets in. Tomorrow they will be safe in Stettin and Kiel. Just after 9 p.m., Heinz Schon, an 18-year-old sailor on the Gustloff, is getting off duty. I felt a large explosion. I thought we hit a mine. But then there was a second and a third explosion. It was obvious that the ship was severely damaged. The lights were out. The ship was listing sharply, and she was not making any speed. Then I knew it was a torpedo. The ship rolls to her port side and awakens 11-year-old Irene Kusubovka. She is in her mother's arms with her sister Ellen and cousin Evelyn. We felt the hit, and everything listed all at once, and we were thrown against the wall. Like we were already against the wall, but it would have been hard to get up. And in a few seconds, the ship straightened itself, but not before I could see that thing, that piano rolling down towards us. And I thought, boy, it's in our path. At first, the upper deck is strangely calm and silent. But below the ship's waterline, a catastrophe has begun. If you're in a lower deck, water, panic, pandemonium. Some people frantically fought, a scratching. And doors that were locked, at, or closed at least, uh, pushing their way over masses of humanity to get topside, to get to a life jacket, to get to a life raft. A thousand, two thousand probably died within minutes as the torpedoes exploded, as the freezing water rushed in to the lower decks. Through gaping holes at the bow, foreship, and engine room, the sea comes rushing in. Among the first to die are 300 female auxiliaries bedded down in a makeshift dormitory. In an effort to save the ship, the captain gives an order that dooms hundreds below deck. The captain ordered the bow sections closed so that nobody had a chance to get out, even if they were alive. Later I learned that those who didn't drown right away suffocated, maybe as long as 48 hours later. The disaster spreads upward from the bottom of the ship until the Gustloff is totally engulfed in panic and pandemonium. Thousands of people scared out of their minds make a mad dash to the top deck. There was a panicking mass of people trying to get through the halls to the deck. I saw a layer of bodies, mostly children, who had been stampeded by people trying to get out. All order breaks down. Survival is a matter of random luck. Aboard the Gustloff that night, terror reigned because everyone knew there was no way they could be saved. In the panic sweeping the ship, six-year-old Ellen Kuzabovka, her sister Irene, cousin Evelyn, and mother fight the crush for the top deck. We were just lucky that we weren't given a cabin and sent down below because I understand that they didn't have a chance because the, the you know, narrow hallways and little small cabins, they never got out. We were just lucky that we were only allowed to sleep on the dining room floor. All I can tell you is that we were near the chimney because when we let go, we just slid down the deck onto the chimney and the huge waves washed us into the sea. And we kept on sinking, well, at least I did. I kept on sinking and sinking and it was, um, as if my lungs were going to burst. All at once I was up again. So what do you do? You start swimming. There are not enough lifeboats to save all the passengers. Many are overcrowded and crash into the sea. 
As the number of boats dwindle, violence erupts. 1,000 people tried to get into the last lifeboat. There were shootouts. People were shooting each other to secure a place on the boat. The boats that reached the water safely refused to help the drowning. There were pontoon boats near us, and we tried to hang on, and they flung our hands off because I don't blame them. They wanted to be saved themselves. There is death in the water and on the decks. The desperation is so complete that many begin committing suicide. Up on deck was the family of a high-ranking Nazi official. His wife begged him to kill the family, which he did. He shot his two children and her. Then he put the pistol to his own head, but he was out of bullets. So he called to me and asked me to do it for him or give him my pistol. But I told him I didn't have a gun. So he let go of the railing and just slid into the water after his wife and two children and drowned. From a distance, Captain Maranesco watches the disaster unfold. War is war. Somebody wins, somebody loses. We could have been sunk, but it was their turn. In the icy sea, hypothermia sets in. It is only a matter of minutes before death silences the hundreds of screams crying out in the darkness on the water. There were masses of people. They were all on top of you and beside you, and uh, you just kept going down and down and drinking and drinking till you thought your lungs were going to burst and all at once you're up again, and it's all because of the life jacket, otherwise I would have been gone. Within a half hour, the first ships arrive on the scene to rescue survivors, but it's too late for many. They had lowered a rope, and a woman ahead of me was to be pulled up, and she grabbed it with both hands and was being pulled up, and she was, I don't know how many feet up, but her hands let go. They must have been too cold. And she fell down in front of me and hit the side of the lifeboat and just disappeared in the water. And then I was next. I had to be pulled up, so they never found her. Among the dead is Ellen and Irene's 13-year-old cousin, Evelyn. We were told that all the bodies who, which washed on sh shore were put in mass graves. And I don't even know where they are. I sure would like to visit it. Fifty minutes after the attack, the Gustloff begins to sink to the bottom. Suddenly, her lights go on. Among the rescue ships and drowning passengers, the sinking ship's light reveals a frightening silhouette, Marinesco's sub. The most unreal thing that happened was that in the middle of these people who were fighting for the rest of their lives was Marinesco on the surface of the water. He was in the middle of all these swimming casualties because the fourth torpedo had not left the boat and got stuck. They manned the gun in the fore section of the submarine, and some of the people in the water were afraid they would now shoot at the survivors in the water. Captain Maranesco does not shoot. The deck gun is manned, but the crew is racing to shove the stuck torpedo back into the sub. As long as it remains there, the S-13 cannot dive. The crew barely finishes when a German warship arrives. The German battleship started right away to attack the S-13, which wasn't able to get underwater fast enough. The commander ordered the hatches closed and the ship to dive. They could hear the battleship's propellers. But the shallow water could be the S-13's death sentence. They tried to get us with depth charges. We ran so silently they couldn't hear us. The explosion underwater is so incredible you can feel it. We knew that if they hit us, it'd be all over. Everyone was so scared we'd be in these frozen poses. We put mattresses on the floor to absorb the noise in case something fell on deck. There was a lot of stress. I got under those mattresses and chewed on dried bread. My commander came over to me and told me to shut up because I was making too much noise. The S-13 survives the attack. 
The next morning, Captain Marinesco resumes his patrol. Meanwhile, Adolf Hitler learns that the Gustloff, a cherished symbol of the Third Reich, is gone and with her 9,300 Germans. Hitler tries to keep this catastrophe a secret from the German people, but Swedish newspapers report the story to the world. February 1st, 1945. After sinking the Gustloff, Captain Marinesco continues the hunt for German ships. On patrol, he saw another huge liner that had the mission to evacuate wounded soldiers from the Eastern Front. It was impossible to tell where it was going, so he waited for it to come back. The ship is the Steuben. Given her easterly course and immense size, Captain Marinesco assumes she is a troop transport like the Gustloff, sent to evacuate Germans to the west. But the Steuben is a hospital ship. The German Navy still believes the real danger in the Baltic lies in mines, not submarines. With one escort, the Steuben leaves port on February 9th with 4,000 wounded soldiers and German refugees. Typically, a hospital ship's Red Cross spares her from attack, but not this time. Given the adrenaline flow of the submariners in the Soviet submarines that had made it into the Baltic, given the weather conditions, um, the fact that it was night, the ships were not well lit, I would say it's argumentative whether they could even see the markings. By the same token, these were Soviets, those were Germans, and after what had happened between 1941 and 1944, shoot them, they're Germans. Just before midnight, the Steuben crosses the S-13's path. Fyodor Davidov remembers the attack. It was a more complicated attack. We shot torpedoes from the bow, but they missed. Then we turned the boat around and shot two more from the stern tubes. They hit. There were two explosions from the first two torpedoes, then several big explosions after that. Then, from the dark spot on the horizon, there was lots of fire. Paul Niehaus was a sailor on board. At the time the ship was torpedoed, operations were being made in the hospital on board, operations of all kinds. The physicians, the doctors, had to abandon everything because the ship began to sink. Most of the Steuben's 4,000 passengers had no chance of survival. Horst Oppenberg was a 19-year-old midshipman on a torpedo boat trying futilely to rescue survivors. If I remember right, 3,500 people died, but this was due to the fact that they were all bedridden soldiers. They only had heavily wounded casualties almost on board and there was very little rescue going on afterwards because these people were incapacitated, uh, they couldn't move by themselves. Captain Marinesco escapes easily. Five days later, Marinesco's killer submarine leaves the Gulf of Danzig in the Baltic Sea for good. The S-13's patrol accounts for the greatest loss of life at sea, nearly 14,000 German dead. But his glory was not to last long. May 8, 1945, the Soviet Union celebrates the German defeat. Soldiers and sailors march in victory through Moscow's Red Square, but Marinesco is not invited. Marinesco never got the recognition he wanted and which he certainly deserved. Penetrating the minefields, taking his ship on a patrol in the Baltic, sinking two enemy ships with the tremendous impact that must have had when the German high command learned of the casualties. He is considered a disgrace, not a hero. He had a reputation as a drunkard, uh, visiting houses of ill repute, running his submarine his way and not necessarily the Navy way. But to my mind, his accomplishments, that man certainly deserved high recognition from the Soviet Navy, the Soviet government. Instead, Marinesco is sent to prison in Siberia in 1946. His crime? Letting a friend take bricks from a construction site. When he returns, he is a broken man in failing health. After the war, anything that was on their record, any blemish, was often used by the NKVD, the state security force, 
uh, to imprison the people. They wanted no one who wasn't perfect in their post-war, their new society. And he certainly wasn't perfect. He finds work in an auto factory and spends the rest of his life in obscurity. In 1963, at the age of 50, Captain Alexander Marinesco dies, forgotten by the state, but still remembered by his victims. For many years, I couldn't sleep at night, always having dreams of that disaster. I never will forget those cries for help of children, of women. It was an experience I never will forget. I can still feel my stomach going and not, and, and it just upsets me, and it, it makes me all uncomfortable, and I, I just want to get away from it. And I'm like an ostrich. I just want to hide my head from it, you know. And it's there. It's such a big chunk of my life, but I don't visit that spot very often. Those new subs that Adolf Hitler was so eager to deploy with cadets from the Wilhelm Gustloff were, at the time, the most advanced underwater weapon ever developed. After the war, these German submarines became the prototypes for the Allied Navy until the advent of atomic power. I'm Arthur Kent for the History Channel. Thanks for watching. Discover more about this and every History's Mysteries topic at HistoryChannel.com.